This might feel a little strange to you. You're going to stand in silence for the next 20 minutes, focusing on your body. We're going to watch you. We're your audience. What experience is your body offering you in this situation? A performance situation. Are you aware of your body? Are parts of you lighting up, making themselves prominent? Can you feel our gaze on your body? Does it empower you? Does it intimidate you? Drop into your body. Your body is the site of this performance. What if a musician's technique could be viewed not as a finite collection of tools or skills, measurable and classifiable by external metrics, but as a growable, malleable knowledge resource within the body of the performer? What could be gained if every instance of practice, whether a first solitary exploration in a rehearsal studio or an eventual presentation in a public setting, was approached as an experiment with the potential to generate new breadth, new depths, new facets of embodied knowledge. Would we still evaluate technique as good or bad, better or worse? Or might we instead seek through technique new ways of knowing? How might this paradigm shift change how we teach and learn in the field of music performance? This video essay offers some practice-led responses to these questions through a developing creative framework that continues to shape our work in higher education performance pedagogy. We begin from the premise outlined by theatre practitioner and theorist Ben Spatz, who proposes that knowledge inheres in practice and that technique is not merely mechanical, but is epistemic, structured by and productive of knowledge. Technique, Spatz tells us, is embodied knowledge that structures practice. Practice is applied technique, which gives us concrete moments of doing, bounded in time and space, unique and unrepeatable. As we practice, technique sediments itself in the lived body, giving rise to reliable new pathways of doing that, in time, can become principles for new practice. Spatz's position on technique represents a turn in the culture of performance pedagogy, from outcome-oriented to process-led, critically reflective, epistemic practice. It contributes richly to a broad discourse surrounding the epistemic capacities of practice, which include phenomenological approaches, embodied cognition and active approaches, and more recently, 4E cognition, helpfully summarized here by Lauren Hayes. Spatz adds to these frameworks some profound implications for embodiment as a channel for practice research and pedagogy. For Spatz, practice both uses existing technique and generates new technique. Practice, then, produces new knowledge. So practice is a way of researching. 
While the main work in performance pedagogy is directed towards the body, other kinds of research will and must be going on to support a performance practice. These could include historical, biographical, musicological, technological, acoustic, sociological, cultural or pedagogical research. In today's higher education contexts, these practices are highly distributed, both in terms of type and level of experience, with some students rooted in the reading and interpreting of scores and of composed and notated works, while others might not use any written materials at all. Most will learn to navigate notated instruction in critical and perhaps novel ways. In terms of embodied knowledge, performance students can be described as undertaking a programme of research from which epistemic objects may arise in any of the following areas. Touch, including listening. The oral imagination or inner hearing and responsiveness. Specific actions relating to the instrument of voice. Ways of movement, breath, balance, posture, tension psychology and psychoacoustics, and confidence and motivation. We're still here, had you forgotten? Did the other goings-on in the world draw your attention away from your performing body? Were you aware of us watching? Does our gaze affect how you feel in performance? You can create a membrane, a private space inside a shared space. You can create a membrane anytime in any performance space. You can return here to enjoy your practice. To start, bring your hands to your face. Your skin will perceive their proximity. Note this feeling. You can access this awareness whenever you wish and transport a heightened sensation across your body. You can excite your nervous system to create this feeling, a membrane that surrounds your body. Your membrane is semi-permeable. Sounds and actions can pass from you to the outside world, but none can pass back through your membrane. Inside your membrane is a space that is environmentally, acoustically, and emotionally ideal for you to carry out your practice. Our gaze hits the membrane, but you won't notice us. Inside the membrane, you're absorbed with your practice. By the time a music student enters higher education, they will have amassed a certain amount of technique, including various learning and coping strategies in relation to the embodied practice of performance and its preparation. Some of these can be framed as scaffolding, structural concepts, such as how to breathe, maintain posture, or move from one area of the instrument to another. At this level, rather than layering further structural ideas or instructions over the top of this scaffolding, it can be useful to draw focus into the body in a way that releases habitualized behaviors and sets aside conscious analytical processing, removing some of the now redundant scaffolding. This allows the musician to get out of their own way and move forward with attention to and trust in what the body knows how to do. to an audience and sort of how we kind of lean into an audience yes. and then try to get close to them. This time I want you to take the pressure of how you stand, let an imaginary bunch of them from the crown of your head that, that is sort of lined up with your back and into your tailbone. Right? Stand in the four points of contact on the floor, slightly in your heels, 
and let the spongy rip very gently without causing you any pain and discomfort. Um, just take the weight of gravity away from you so that the body can just hang. Yeah? And allow that. And then you can gently move. And actually, as you step sideways, you can take one or two steps sideways or forwards. And it will move with you a bit like a Todd Jones car, if you know what that is. Like those, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now, wherever you move, the head and the neck will just go with you and they'll stay so you can kind of flop around. Okay. Like this. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Now, allow yourself to start imagining that music again. And now let the bungee hold you. Take care of gravity. And you take care of the same. Tunes and bring a moment of In other words, and all Great, and then one more time We can just allow ourselves to be a bit playful And sort of let the body move around loosely And just notice your shoulders and your neck and your back As you do that, and as you breathe in Tunes and bring a moment of In other words, and all Right, and in response to that you don't have the whole hunched forward stress that you need to like put, portray something, it's just it just happens. Okay, you're worried about this. Put your brain there. Right, so we're going flat and just feeling Feel the water kind of slosh back and forth and feel how when you tip to one side or to the other side, that side takes the gravity of the water mm. a little bit. And if you tip it all the way, at some point, boom, the water rushes, yeah? It's not like you've pushed the bottle down. Mm. The bottle sinks as a result of it being filled, mm. right? Yeah. Okay, so let's put the bottle down. And we're going to imagine that the arm, the bow arm, yeah. is also half full of water. We could imagine that the water is kind of pooling equally flat across the entire area. Mm. Now, we're going to pay very close attention to the sensation here in the shoulder blade. Okay. Okay? Yeah. As we raise the arm, at some point, yeah, mm. all the water will sink back to the shoulder blade. Mm. Let's try that again. As we raise the arm, at some point, the water rushes back into the shoulder blade, and the shoulder blade whew, absorbs that weight. Yeah. There. Trust it, it'll do it. Sorry. Yeah, and all you have to do to keep this in, in control is retain a little bit of awareness with the three mm -hmm. and hold the bow to the sounding point so that it doesn't flip away. Yeah? Try one more time. string crossings is no problem now. Mm, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. How does that feel? Way more in control. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good. If I do get out of my own way, where do I go? Performance discourse in music is often constrained by the ideal of virtuosity, a trajectory presided over by an invisible master, someone so immersed in practice so unimpeded by material or technical or physical considerations that they've achieved a fully unmediated state. Having achieved mastery, it is implied, the musician's body begins to fade from cognition. Their instrument becomes a site of non-resistance and technique is reduced to that which must be transcended for true genius to appear. Such a viewpoint posits the body as an obstacle to total immersion in practice and imposes on the practitioner the goal of reaching a mastery state in which the body ceases to concern the performer, a state of mindless flow. Hubert and Stuart Dreyfus's commonly cited model of skill acquisition offers one representation of such an approach to technique. In the Dreyfus model of mental activities involved in skill acquisition, initial novice and competent stages are marked by a decomposed understanding of new situations, with analytical decision-making. These so-called mental functions become holistic at the stages of proficiency and expertise, respectively. A state of mastery is experienced periodically at high levels of expertise and absorption in a task. A 
counter viewpoint of the performer instrument relationship as multimodal participatory space is proposed by Pedro Rebello. In performance, moreover, Far from becoming unmediated, a more intense self-awareness and constant adjustment is negotiated within a phenomenological performative layer. While the Dreyfus model can be useful up to a point, particularly in considerations of its various functional layers, it is all too easily and too often read as a linear trajectory that adheres to the goals of expertise and mastery. Lauren Hayes critiques this acquisitional approach to knowledge, arguing that a discourse that focuses on aspects of technical virtuosity does not adequately account for the dynamic relationships that are reified during musical play. For the purposes of our argument, Hayes' concerns might be rearticulated in terms of a fixation on certain particular and highly trained actions, manual, pedal, facial, vocal, etc., directed toward the instrument as a tool or extension of the body. However, if technique is knowledge, virtuosity might be equally apparent in one's ability to learn as in one's ability to do. A curriculum that places practice structures at its core is necessarily open and inclusive to diverse levels of knowledge, experience, practice types, and ability. To generalize from Hayes' remarks on improvisation, Reorienting our focus from outcomes towards processes can provide much needed and fruitful ground for growth and motivation across a wide and inclusive spectrum of students. Performance in the university music degree can in this way be viewed not exclusively as a trajectory toward excellence, but more aptly as a space in which experimental, critically engaged art is happening. An alternative to the novice to master trajectory is offered by Michael Schwab's frameworks of experimentation. Taking up Hans-Jörg Reinberger's theory of experimental systems, Schwab suggests such a system will play out its own intrinsic capacities as the experimenter learns to handle the system until it is able to surprise the experimenter with its own characteristics, unanticipated by the system's creator. In this mode of experimentation, a singer or instrumentalist can direct their practice toward testing the boundaries and thresholds of their embodied knowledge, structuring their experiments so that, quote, the deployed knowledge results in ruptures from which unexpected new objects relevant to knowledge emerge, end quote. These discoveries, which Reinberger calls epistemic things, can afford the player new insights about music beyond a localized practice of technique. Crucially in performance pedagogy, an experimental approach to embodied practice can arise at any point along the Dreyfus model. As an epistemic project, practice at any level may result in startling and transformative ruptures of knowledge, which, for the developing musician and practice researcher, hold equal value. Here, the body comes into focus as a site of practice, and a practitioner may freely and reflectively rest their attention within its tissues, at the thresholds of its interface with an instrument or technology, or on the phenomena that emerge from it. ...is pushing air out, so I want to blow all the air out of your cheeks, and then when you feel you've got to breath on it, keep blowing. And when you feel like you've got to the point where your body is telling you, I am going to die if I don't breathe right now, I want you to notice that you can do three quick more pushes of breath out. Okay. And at that point, I want you to just relax. So is it one long breath out? It's one long breath out. You start to feel panicky, and when you, but you keep going. And when you feel really empty, push three more times, okay. and then relax. Okay. Just relax, yeah? Really push this one, everything out. Really and My lower back. Lower back, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Is that something you think about when you sing as a previous singer? I should do. You think you should do? I should do, I think. Um, I think it's definitely all connected, I think, with the lower back is what's something I forget about. Right. But yeah. Showing you this exercise 
shows you where the body naturally takes air in, how it fills, and where the body moves. And all you need to do as wind players, grass players, and singers is we need to have a bit more control of that and sometimes pull the bellows out a bit more so that we can push it out. Yeah. So let's do the, the phrase, the Mozart phrase again, the magic of mm -hmm. And you can have your old ones you wrote there and feel free. But see if when you breathe in, you can notice those parts of your body moving and allow the air to come in. Yeah? Okay. In that way. And see how that feels. Be nice and free. Really. Do you want to see A widening of traditional participatory inclusion when applied to higher education does not merely shift educational parameters towards those with limited experience and facility, and importantly, with experience outside of a Western musical model. Indeed, this kind of approach equally affords rich potential for students pushing at an elite level of virtuosity, irrespective of genre. Such approaches offer alternatives to outcome-oriented pedagogies that prioritise achievement at the expense of motivation and investment and to the potential impairment of the health and well-being of students. Indeed, an emphasis on learning as experimentation and on discovery-led processes of research in which the development of technique is seen as a growing of embodied knowledge can carry a profound impact on student experience and engagement. We are nearing the end of your performance. What, if anything, have you learned whilst inside your membrane? Was your membrane a good one? Was there room for improvement? Or are these questions perhaps no longer relevant? Has the experiment drawn frames, revealed thresholds, or opened up ways of knowing? Might these paradigm shifts change how you listen, perform, and participate in music? So often music is like, it's a performance, there's people sitting, so you're playing it for people. And I feel like the, the membrane helps almost reclaim your music, your sound, because it's so personal that you're giving it away to someone else. So it allows you to access that, and I think once that's there, you can just feel more comfortable because it's not for it's not for anyone else anymore. It's, it's more about you. It's changed what the site of investigation is for me. Um, so I I am less interested in like building something something that I already know what it is and I must construct it. Like when I'm playing now, it's much more I am interested in doing a series of things and investigating what they become. And I think that's um, what I take away the most from the exercise is just being capable to draw your attention to where, wherever you want in your body. That's a skill in itself and that's something you can practice and something you can learn to learn to identify things in your body and where they come from and how they connect to each other. We're in the groups, but I kind of feel less like a guitarist now. I feel like someone who plays the guitar and that actually feels much more exciting to me. It's a very weird thing when we use words to describe it, just to describe how we're feeling. Like we're saying, what do we feel about embodiment? But embodiment doesn't stay the same each time we do it. And there's something very fixed about that. And I think that's something that I'm learning. I think just because there's a word for something doesn't mean that, that that's the limit of what we're understanding about music. Like every time I'll do my membrane, it won't be the same each time or maybe think of a different kind of zone. Nothing, nothing is fixed. And the other thing was when watching Katie do the membrane a couple of months ago, that's, I think, also a very powerful experience to watch someone do it in a completely different way, not in terms of your own body, but 
just of empathy towards someone else, especially as performers, we've all been in a situation like this. We all know in different ways what it feels like. It's a change in what I think music is for a start, but it's also a change in what I think a performer is, and then a change in what I think I as a performer am as well.